for the benefit of those who will be hearing this recording a little later. I'll be speaking in a moment on Nehemiah chapter 9, but first of all, um, Nadine will be reading it to us. Thank you, Nadine. Today's reading is Nehemiah chapter 9, verses eight, uh, 1 through 8, and then verses 13 to 21. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Standing on the stairs of the Levites were Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kananai. They cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shabaniah, and Pathahiah said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, and earth, and all that is on it, the seas, and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord of God, you are the Lord God, who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chordians and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Jugosites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. Verse 13. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right, and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked, and they did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them, even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Or when they committed awful blasphemies. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path 
nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and you gave them water from, for their thirst. For forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, as you look at this chapter 9 of Nehemiah, I pray that you will speak to each one of us and take the words that I have prepared and by your spirit, may they enliven our hearts and our minds and enable us to become more like you day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we come to the penultimate um, in our series on Nehemiah. And you will be speaking to us next week, I think on, probably on, I think it's chapter 10. Um, but we're looking at Nehemiah today, and just a brief recap that there's been much opposition to the walls of Jerusalem, but they have been rebuilt by now, and Nehemiah, who's been the leader of the rebuilding, um, steps back, and Ezra, the priest, probably the high priest, now comes into the picture. He came earlier in the book of Ezra, but this is the first time that he properly appears in the book of Nehemiah. And in celebration of the rebuilding of the walls, Ezra, as we heard in chapter 8, that was um, spoken and by, uh, preached on by David last week, um, read from the book of the law every day for four weeks, starting around about the second of the month, which we um, theologians consider was the month of October by, by our calendar, and speaking therefore through to the 30th of the month of October. And now here in chapter 9, on the 24th day of October, uh, therefore with a week to go before he finishes the reading, uh, we read how the people gathered together, in, it would have been in the temple precincts, to uh, engage in a public act of worship. And in this chapter we'll discover four spiritual disciplines which are critical for us if we are to remain spiritually fit and well in our whole being, body, mind, and spirit. Hence the title of today's talk, Spiritual Fitness Program. And we have the discipline in this chapter of the word, the word of God, of confession, of praise, and of thanksgiving. The first discipline, the word, is God's word, is found, of course, in chapter 8. It started there, this particular discipline. And David, in his excellent talk last week, emphasized the importance of putting God's word at the center of our lives. The word of God is a powerful, uh, a powerful thing. St. Paul describes it as the sword of the spirit. So when the people, in chapter 8, heard the word of God, we read that they began to weep. Possibly they were mourning the fact that they had neglected God's word for so long. They were moved by the spirit of God as his word, his living word, was read to them. You know, it's not unusual at times to feel weepy in church because God's presence brings at times a holy weeping and a holy release and a holy healing Nevertheless, as we learned last week, Nehemiah told the people not to weep, but to celebrate, because as he said in verse, eight of chapter, uh, verse 10 of chapter 8, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it reminds me of the parable of the lost son, when, who, when the father, who is a, which is a picture of God, of course, when the father threw a banquet when he returned. And when we return to the Lord, he is overjoyed. And if we weep, it may well be simply for the joy that we be for joy of, that we have been returned to and reconciled to God our Father, a joy also that we have been convicted of our sin and have repented, have turned back to God, and joy because we have been reconciled to God our Creator, our Heavenly Father, and our Savior. In chapter nine, as God's word continued to be read, so the people felt the need to confess 
and repent of their sins, which is the second of the spiritual disciplines. We've had the word of God, and the second one is confession and repentance. It really bothers me when I hear of churches that do not have weekly confession in their services. I've known it happen when one person told the church minister that confessions made them feel uncomfortable, a bit guilty. They meant to. Why is confession though important? Well, first, if you are feeling guilty about something, it is healthy to admit it. This can be done silently before God or through another person, a trusted spiritual friend or a church minister. Mindful, of course, that if we are Christians, Christ has forgiven our sins, past, present, and future. But we will and should still need to voice our confession inwardly to God and sometimes to others. A second reason for confession is to keep us alert to sin. To sin in our lives and to guard against slipping into sinful habits that undermine our relationship with the Lord and with others. Unchecked sin is a destructive force and can lead to human devastation in all kinds of ways. Confession helps us to keep on our spiritual guard. A third reason is that we remain aware of the eternal consequences of sin and do not gloss over these consequences. It was for our sin that Jesus died on the cross, as that hymn brought out so beautifully just now, as the supreme act of love. He did so because he knew the terrible consequences for us. Had he not done so, the consequences would be that we would be forever cut off from the presence and the love of God. And a fourth reason is that confession is good for the Christian community and actually is good for society as a whole. We live in a very intolerant and harsh times and in what has been known as the cancel culture. Unless your views correspond to mine or to the views of the tribe to which I belong, I will cancel you. You will not be tolerated. So invitations to visiting speakers at university have been cancelled, or people have lost their jobs. And there is little tolerance or forgiveness of human foibles. Ollie Robinson, the talented English bowler, was very nearly dropped from the team because of stupid remarks he made several years ago on social media when he was an unthinking and immature teenager. Fortunately, um, good sense prevailed. Society's problem is that many claim to be tolerant, but actually are intolerant. Liberal, but illiberal. Unforgiving and hypocritical. And that probably becomes because many do not think that they themselves are sinful or need to be forgiven. But in my experience, people who recognize their own weaknesses know that they need to be forgiven, are likely to be kind, gracious, tolerant, and compassionate people. And their presence in a church, where of course is where you should certainly see it, their presence in a church should result in a healthy and loving Christian community where Christ's compassion and forgiveness prevail amongst each other. And his presence shines through and is a blessing to one another and, of course, to him. So we've had God's word, we've had confession, and now the third discipline, praise. In verse 4 we read that the Levites, by the way, the Levites, for those of you who are not aware, the Levites were that tribe from which, who had special duties in the temple and religious life, and from whom came also the the priesthood of of Israel. So we read that the the Levites were standing on the stairs, presumably a flight of steps, in the temple somewhere. And in verse 5 they proclaimed, Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. 
Blessed be your glorious name. You alone are the Lord. You made even the highest heavens and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. One outcome of confession should be praise, a response to knowing that our sins have been forgiven that the load has been lifted from us. Praise will come from the heart and be expressed in different ways, including singing God's praises here on a Sunday morning. But why do we praise? Why is praise so important? Well, first of all, it lies at the heart of our relationship with the Lord. He has created humanity to praise and to worship. Firstly, him and then the things he has created for us. The ability and impulse to praise if one is one of God's gifts to us. The ability to feel awe and wonder, to, to be aware of the beauty of music, of color, of creation, whatever it may be, of each other. What a blessing it is. And of course, as we wonder at the glories of creation, may that wonder cause us to worship the Creator, to worship God. Praise is a gift for us to bestow upon God for his blessing. Just as if parents love it when their children come and cuddle with their parents, it's a great blessing. There's something about that in his relationship with us that involves praise and worship and love. As he pours out his love on us, So he loves the praises and the love that we lavish upon him. But he doesn't compel us. He's not like some despot who demands his subject's adoration. No, his great joy is when we, his children, come to him, our Heavenly Father, willingly and trustingly in love and adoration. So firstly, praise lies at the heart of our relationship with God. Secondly, His praises are for our protection. If we don't put the praises of God, the creator, first, then we'll praise and worship the things he has created and we'll be drawn away from him. Think of those people, often prominent people, who worship their money, their power, their status, their talents, and how they have become become consumed by these things. And as a result, are far from God. Some are indeed prominent, but most actually are ordinary folk who have latched onto a focus for their worship, their, their instinct to praise, to admire, and so on, which has taken them away from the Lord. So it's for our protection. It's also praise, a hallmark of a healthy Christian community. When, as an expression of praise of God, we give thanks and praise for each other, his children, then the the Lord's love will be at the heart of our community and bring unity and close fellowship. And linked to that is the fourth reason for praise, that it is the antidote to conceit and pride. When we praise God, we humble ourselves before him. And when someone has done something praiseworthy, we should be quick to say so. It's part of God's character in us. We praise God and he himself loves what we do as children, so we should be generous in affir- affirming one another. If we have a problem there, it may indicate that we have a difficulty with pride or perhaps even a personal insecurity. Fifthly, praise increases our trust in God rather than ourselves, and releases God's power in us. Praising God acknowledges our dependency on him. And because there is less of ourselves to get in the way when we praise him, his power and authority is released in us to be his people and to do the things he's asked us to do. And finally, praise protects us from the work of the evil one, who has no answer or authority when people praise and worship God, our Lord and Saviour. 
So, God's word, confession, and praise. But now the fourth discipline. Sorry. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a close cousin to praise, but is different. Praise is about who the Lord is. Thanksgiving is about what the Lord has done. Now, through most of chapter 9, the worshippers in Jerusalem recalled their journey as God's people. From Abraham, from the deliverance, from slavery in Egypt, the 40 years in the wilderness, the Lord giving them Canaan as the promised land. But they also recalled their disobedience, how they became arrogant and stiff-necked. And by the way, that doesn't mean, say, they woke up in the morning with a crick in the neck. It means they're a bit like oxen or horses. And when you try and sort of maybe go one way or another, their their neck stood rigid. So don't worry, it's not about, you know, you've got a stiff neck this morning, you've got nothing to do with that. And yet how God, of course, was a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he did not deserve them, did not desert them, I should say. And yet they continually disobeyed and eventually found themselves in exile and in slavery, even though by now they were back in Jerusalem, they were still a people subject to another nation, Babylon. Their recall would lead them in the next chapter to recommit themselves to God. At times, What we need to do is remember what God has done for us as a springboard for our own thanksgiving. So we thank him for answered prayers or for the gift of our family or children or friendships. We thank him for our work or or a healing we have received and indeed any blessing, any answer to prayer, anything that we want to say thank you for. And here I need to draw a further distinction between thanksgiving and praise. They are close cousins and they often go hand in hand. For example, we praise God for the creation and we thank him for its beauty and the way it sustains us. But whereas thanksgiving is in response to what he has done for us, true praise is given unconditionally. And at times we may not feel like praising. I'm reminded of those words from the prophet Habakkuk in chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in God my Saviour. You see, praise may need to be an act of pure will. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. And if we cannot put our praise into words, let's allow our Christian music to carry us into a place of praise. But of course, sometimes, as I'm sure we can all testify, sometimes we are in such a low place that there's any form of praise is really hard. But God knows that. And during those times will sustain us until we can praise him once more. And even when we praise, when we praise, even when things are bad, as Habakkuk says, we will find ourselves joyful in God our Saviour. So there are four disciplines, pursuing God's word, confession, praise and thanksgiving. But there's one more, of course, which I've not mentioned, prayer. It's not highlighted in chapter 9, but it's there throughout the chapter. For it is the prayer by which we understand God's word. It is prayer by which we confess our sins. It is prayer by which we praise his name. And it is prayer by which we thank him for all he has done for us. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we say together, O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by your governance to do always what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now Martin will come and lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Dear Lord, give us now a sense of your presence as we bring you our prayers. Everlasting God, help us find time in our busy lives where we can, through prayer and reflection, be lost in your wonder, love and praise. We come to you poor yet rich, weak and yet strong, with our prayers that your promise may be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. We ask for your wisdom, for your strength and for your power to be constantly present within us. Would you whisper in our ear when we need to run and touch our heart when we need to stand our ground? Give us endurance to stay the course or from being distracted by other things that would try and call us away from a close walk with you. In the dying moments on the cross, you gave us the greatest illustration of forgiveness possible. And so here today in Swinbrook, we ask for your forgiveness for all we have done wrong this past week. Our hearts are turned towards you, yet you know how often we fail. Have mercy on us, and thank you that we can turn back to you each day in prayer. Thank you for being with us here today in Swinbrook, and with all your people throughout the world, and in all their different cultures and environments. We pray for all their suffering, poverty, depression, persecution, slavery, injustice, famine and disease and from all those hurting from the effects of war, especially in those parts of the world where they face open hostility and violence. We pray particularly today for peace, comfort, and a hope to restore the spirits of those crushed by the terror-driven chaos in Afghanistan. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones and those who are fearful for their future and for the future of their country. Lord, please restrain the Taliban from evil and guide them to pursue righteousness and justice in accordance with your word. To everyone in that troubled country, be with them in their isolation and be close to all those who are suffering or afraid. In their darkness, be their light. In their anxiety, be their hope. And in their loneliness, be their consolation. Here at home, it's an uncertain time politically for our nation too. Brexit, Covid and the tensions in Parliament have dominated the headlines for months. As Christians, whatever our opinions, may we pray for our government, for Her Majesty the Queen, her ministers and all those who hold positions of authority and power, that they may govern fairly and always do what is right. We pray for the Prime Minister and party leaders as they negotiate the political future. We remember all those who have put their lives on the line for our safety. The police, the firefighters, lifeboat crews, and especially members of all the armed forces. We pray for them and their families. Your word reminds us that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We pray for our own church here in the Cotswolds, especially our leaders, Andrew, Gerald, David, Ruth, Paul and Martin, and for Hilary and Lizzie and Joe on the music team, our church wardens, and for all those who contribute to our church life and to the glory of God. As we have heard in past gospel readings of Jesus' compassion for the sick, so we pray for all those who are not well at this time, especially those known to us, as we share a brief moment of silence together.
Let us remember all those who are homeless or lonely. We pray for the housebound, for all those facing certain uncertain futures, and all those in caring roles, that you may bestow on them your gift of patience, compassion, and understanding. By dying on the cross, Jesus paid the punishment for our sins, and he rose again to prove that death was truly defeated. He is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. And so we pray for all those who have been drawn to his eternal rest in his safekeeping, and for all those who mourn their passing. Dear Lord, we know that in times of both celebration and also in times of trouble, your heart is always with us, your eyes are always over us, and your ears are always open to hear our prayers. And so we ask you today that you grant us peace in our homes and villages, peace in our churches, and peace in our hearts. We don't know what will cross our path this coming week, but you are our rock, our fortress, our comfort, and our strength. Help us to anchor ourselves to you as we go out into the world. May you be the hope of our journey and the light on our way. May you be our path and our guide, the fire in our hearts. May you be the wind in our sails and the reason that we live. Amen. We say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.